Bubble's pricing structure is based on workload usage. But what exactly is workload? And what are some ways that you can maximize your workload units so that you're only using what you actually need? While workload management can feel unpredictable and even a bit confusing at times, there are many factors within your control. And if you're building an app on Bubble, you must be aware of every single one of these. In this video, we're walking through those factors. Make sure that you stick around until the end because whether or not you take each of these into account will affect how your Bubble app performs. And because of that, which pricing tier your app will need to be on. First, let's cover some terminology you must understand in order to take control over your app. Workload. This is a measurement of all activity your app is doing to make things work. How you build your app and how your users engage with the app will affect the amount of workload consumption. Workload unit. This is workload's unit of measurement. So for example, if workload is distance, then workload unit is a mile or kilometer, a meter, a foot, a yard. You'll typically see this abbreviated to WU. And every bubble plan comes with a certain number of workload units per month. Activity type. There are 12 types of activity that contribute to your app's workload. These include things like database changes, page load, searching the database, communicating with APIs, and more. We'll expand on these in a moment. Workload tier. Every bubble plan comes with a certain amount of allowed workload units. Again, think mileage. If your app needs more workload units, you can either upgrade your app to a higher plan or add on an additional workload tier. This is a separate plan that gives you more workload units. Keep in mind, not every app necessarily needs an additional workload tier. Workflow. This is not to be confused with workload. Remember, workload is just a measurement of your app's activity, whereas workflows are the logic-based triggers and actions that you build to make your app interactive, modify the database, and more. Understand that some of this terminology may be new to you, but the underlying principle behind them relates to how well your app is optimized. You always want to build an optimized app for your own sake as a developer, for your user's sake as the ones experiencing the app, and to make sure you're not forcing your app onto a higher tiered bubble plan without really needing to. This has always been our own focus and is what we help our private entrepreneurs do each and every day. We help them build a scalable foundation for their apps as they go from idea to first launch, and you should be doing the exact same. Let's now dive into the key areas you want to focus on to optimize your app's workload. We're going to start with activity types. Activity types are essentially categories of possible activities that your app can experience. Each of these raw activities has a base workload unit cost, and it's important to understand that most app operations are a combination of several activities with varying degrees of complexity. So the more complex, the more workload units you're going to need. For example, creating a new database record with conditions, search operations, constraints on those searches would cost more than creating a new record with no conditions, no searches, no mapped fields, right? They're technically both executing a, uh, an action to create a new record in the database, but Bubble is doing extra work for the action that also needs to run conditions and do extra database queries and apply filters to those. And that's gonna be reflected in your overall workload unit consumption. The challenge you need to overcome is predicting the right number of workload units your app will consume on any given month. Because your app's activity can vary by day, by hour, or even by the minute, it's easier if you use an aggregate planning approach. Try to measure your workload units by a date interval that gives you a fair representation of common consumption. Now, this isn't going to be consistent every single time, and it's always going to vary by app, but if you were to sample a date interval, let's say a 24 hour period or even a week, month, at any point in time, your average workload unit consumption should consistently be around the same count. And you can also factor in growth over time. What you should aim to understand is the following. Which activity types make up the majority of consumption? What patterns and trends in your app's activity, especially if it's mostly driven by user behavior compared to fixed automations? Um, what can you find out of that that you can better predict for the future? Where do you want to place your priorities? For example, keeping a complex, expensive workflow may be worth the higher cost if it's serving a very vital core function in your app and has little room for reworking. The more predictable your activity is, the more you can focus your optimization efforts on the right areas and choose the best plan to fit your needs.
With this strategic approach in mind, there are several tools that you can use to gather this information so you can find those patterns and really learn what your app's workload needs are going to be. The first is your general app plan details. Make sure you understand how many workload units are available to you per month and uh, how many you have already used. So you can find that information within your editor settings. The next tool, and this is uh, really the biggest tool available to you, are your app metrics. So you can find this within the logs of your editor. This is the primary monitoring screen of your overall workload. Here, Bubble has several visualizations to show you your total workload over a span of time across both your development and live versions of your application. Most of these visualizations are interactive, so you can drill down to more specific activity information and or change the different time periods. You want to get into the habit of making the screen part of your normal development work. As you understand which activities and types are higher in workload units, you'll find more opportunities to optimize. Next are your server logs. These will show you one of the most granular pieces of data, which is the exact amount of workload units that an activity consumed. This is especially helpful if you need to compare those workload units for different approaches in logic, or, you or if you have a, a complex workflow made up of various actions with various conditions, this will tell you exactly how many workload units it needed. Now, let's talk about a few development best practices. This is really where you put your logic together custom for your own application, and how well you do this is really going to influence your application's workload consumption. Your database structure is one of the biggest factors that can have a really strong influence on things. So here are a few tips to keep in mind when you're putting together that architecture. First, it's generally better to have more data types with fewer fields than less data types with more fields. This approach helps break down the data into smaller parts, making it more efficient for Bubble to fetch it. So don't be afraid to create more data types to break things down. Next, list fields. List fields can really work for or against you. So understand when it's appropriate to use them. The more items in a record's list field, the bigger that single record is gonna be and make a search query of that data type much heavier. On the other hand, list fields can be a fantastic way to keep nested repeating groups, for example, more optimized. But just remember that different structures can be more or less forgiving. You're just going to have to try out and see what works best for your specific use case. Option sets. Use option sets to manage a list of choices that don't need to be managed by your users wherever you can, because option sets are not a part of your database. So they're more efficient than regular search queries. I can't stress the importance of your data structure enough. And this is actually one of the very first things we make sure our own entrepreneurs have right. It's the foundation of your data-driven app. So if you want help, building that foundation too, from your database structure all the way to your pilot launch, apply for a strategy call over at coachingnocodeapps.com slash call. We'll help you create a custom roadmap for your app's development, and then see whether it'd be a good fit to help you turn that roadmap into a scalable pilot app. Next, let's talk about your repeating group structures. Repeating groups are a type of element that are so flexible, you have many different ways of designing lists. You want to be very careful with this as well, because you can really hurt your performance or help it. So first, you want to avoid doing database searches inside of the repeating group cells whenever you can, because that's just going to multiply with every cell. If you can, store the information you need in a, a separate field within a database record, use custom states, use contained list fields if possible. You also want to take a look at the repeating group's design. So how many rows and columns are you having bubble load in one time? What's your paging system going to look like if the repeating group is uh, you know, loading lots and lots of items all at once? Now let's talk about modifying data. When you're creating or updating data, it's much more efficient and cost-effective to update more database fields and fewer actions than it is to update less fields across multiple actions. Uh, right? You're, you're running less change actions, uh, which is going to cost you less workload units. So if you can try to use a single save button, uh, to commit input values or custom states to a record, that's much more efficient than auto binding or uh, updating something every time an input's value is changed, especially if you have many inputs involved. Okay, those each of those changes are just going to cost more workload units. As far as deleting records go, that can also chip away at your workload units pretty quickly. So put in measures to prevent unnecessary deleting to begin with. For example, instead of creating a blank record before a user starts filling in information, Require the user to enter some, if not all, data if possible, uh, and then create the record. At that point, they're at least committed to what they've entered in. They're more likely to uh, not abandon the process. 
And overall, you just want to reduce the number of blank or orphaned records that will eventually be deleted anyway, which are just going to cost you more workload units. Now let's talk about searching your database, because this can come with varying levels of complexity. Try constraining your search as much as you can uh, before you try to load more information than you really need to the browser and for the user to start working with. The more manipulations you add after a search, the more expensive things are going to get, the more complicated it is, uh, and the more workload units potentially uh, that are going to cost you. What about calculated values? You can always calculate in real time on the page, but that could come at the cost of having more searches than you really need. You need to perform calculations such as total amount of unpaid invoices or a number of followers. Save that calculated value to a record. Use a workflow for that to reduce unnecessary real-time searches uh, and instead just watch for updates to update the record whenever necessary. Now, this does work best for calculations that don't need to be updated often. Otherwise, the number of database changes could actually outweigh the cost of a search. So it's something that you're gonna have to balance. Now, consolidating searches. Bubble is smart enough to perform one search if it sees multiple identical queries. However, you wanna leverage things like custom states and previous steps in a workflow to access data that has already been fetched wherever possible. Again, the idea here isn't necessarily to eliminate all of these high cost activities, but simply to reduce them wherever possible. Now let's talk about recurring workflows. This is a type of workflow that requires the most vigilance because it is easy to create an accidental infinite loop in the backend uh, environment or to have just unnecessary workflows running every X number of seconds uh, to check for updates or check for changes that are happening. Use conditions to ensure that you're only running these actions when necessary. You want workflows to have a clear beginning and a clear end as much as possible. But do be mindful that a recursive workflow is preferred over making a change to a list of things when that list is over 100 items or so. Uh, it's just a more performant operation. Now, when you're working with server-side plugins and API calls, there are a number of things to be aware of here as well, especially since every configuration with an external service can have its own uh, requirements and its own uh, considerations to look after. When you're designing a call to an API, or using a plugin as a data source in your design, avoid setting a container's default data source, so a group or a repeating group, uh, to that API response or to that plugin data. What you want to try to do instead is use a condition so that it only triggers those calls when the environment is right, right? Uh, this could also help you avoid any wasted calls. It can help you avoid any errors. A lot of times with API calls and plugin data, you have a lot of requirements that you need to fill in first. You may need to provide IDs for things. You may need to have uh, inputs filled in in order to populate the, the API request. So use the condition in order to trigger the call or have the user click on a button to trigger the call. Try to avoid setting these data sources um, as a default, where as soon as the page is loaded, Bubble tries to run the calls. Again, it could, uh, in effect, create wasted calls or generate you know, errors that are really unnecessary. As with all things in development, regardless of the workload measurement, you want to follow a constant cycle of building, measuring, and learning. Focus on getting your feature to work first, to give yourself a baseline, test your work, review the impact on workload units within the server logs and your app metrics, learn from those analytics, and implement adjustments as needed from there, and repeat that cycle. Never stop this cycle, even as your app grows over time, because Circumstances may shift, and you may want to evolve your logic with that growth as it happens, not when there's an emergency. You have a lot of control over how your app is developed on Bubble, but you must take advantage of that in order to build a well-performing app. If you want help taking that control, head to coachingnocodeapps.com slash call to apply for a strategy call, where we'll put together a development roadmap for your app, and then see whether it'd be a fit to help you turn that roadmap into a scalable first version. All right, I hope this was helpful, and we'll see you in the next one.